To repeat what Julie said, San Diego recruited the Salk Institute in the very beginning. And I believe that this is exactly where we stand right now with OAS about to open. The next step then is forming a cluster. How can OAS work with various entrepreneurs, local businesses, Japanese businesses, and international businesses to develop an R&D cluster? Now, to do this, we need to draw from the experience of Silicon Valley, which is the number one successful cluster in the world. So before we enter the second part of our discussion, we have a presentation from Dr. Sas Somek explaining exactly what happened in Silicon Valley. So I prepared a small presentation, and I'll uh, describe it. Um, so I come, uh, came across very interesting statistics recently, and I wanted to share it with you and then tell you about my experience, the, the interaction between entrepreneurship and uh, R&D cl clusters. So here's the statistics. This is venture capital activity, how much money goes to small companies to support small companies as a percent of GDP. So if you look on the left-hand side, the two large numbers are Israel and, and the United States. And if you look at the smallest number in the chart, it's Japan <laughs> on the right-hand side. So I've lived uh, the past 30 years in Silicon Valley and participated in the growth there. I'm originally from Israel, and I do business in Israel. And um, I worked in the semiconductor equipment industry, so I used to travel to Japan once a month. So I'm reasonably familiar with Japan as well. So the goal uh, that here in Okinawa is to try to move in that direction. And if we want to move in that direction, what does it take to do it? So the first thing, let's try to understand this ecosystem that is needed to support entrepreneurship in an R&D cluster. So this is from my experience. This is a successful entrepreneurship knowledge centers. And it's the combination of a few things. First is an infrastructure, uh, which I'll discuss. Then access to markets. Uh, and the third one are entrepreneurs. And all of that is supported by a very strong culture. So if I, uh, to add details here, in the infrastructure, you need to have very good universities. You need to have money available to start companies. And you need to have experienced investors, not just money. It's not money given by the government. You need good investors who know how to separate between good investment and not so good investment. And as far as access to market, you want to be able to access large markets. You want to be able to collaborate with customers so you don't work in isolation. And then you want merger and acquisition or public market so entrepreneurs can make money. And when you look at entrepreneurs, you want a combination of talents, uh, not just technology. You also want a good marketing, and you want to have people, uh, entrepreneurs who can run companies, small, medium, and bring them to be large companies. And then from culture point of view, as we discussed here, you need a culture of innovation. You need to be able to take risks, and you want a fast pace. Um, I call it driver mentality, maybe even use the word aggressive mentality in order to move forward and, and create a companies and then push them to grow. So this is, uh, in general, from my experience, how I would describe all the ingredient necessary in the ecosystem. And then these relationships become symbiotic and they help each other. So good universities help entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs make money and then contribute to the universities. And that's how this whole ecosystem continues. And one success leads to another, and then it builds uh, a complete ecosystem in a given place uh, to do that. And there are two places that I wanted to describe to you. One is Silicon Valley, and the other one is Israel. And then talk a little bit about Okinawa, my uh, little um, uh, maybe thoughts in that area. So Silicon Valley entrepreneurship, this is sort of the icon for the world. 
And um, maybe the unique thing, the most unique thing about Silicon Valley is the ability to attract and retain the best people of the world. It's like a big magnet that brings people from all over the world. And you'll see uh, in companies I was involved, uh, usually Americans are general managers in marketing. Chinese are very good at process development. Indians are very good at software. But, but it's just bringing the best people in the world and being, uh, building an economy there uh, based on that. So, um, and, and the, the attracting of these people is really compatible with the history of the U.S. of, of an immigration uh, and so on. How did it start in Silicon Valley? It was an idea of a professor, Professor Terman of Stanford University. He was the dean of the engineering school. And in 1939, beginning of the 40s, he recommended to Bill Hewitt and David Packard to start a company based on some of the work that they've done uh, at Stanford. And this is how the company Hewlett Packard or HP uh, started in that time frame uh, to do that. Since then, um, um, there were several generations of uh, successes that built, built Silicon Valley to what it is today. Um, the expertise is so-called high tech and life sciences that includes uh, biotech. But now there's a great deal of focus there on clean tech, uh, alternative energy and, and sustainability in general. So this was an example that started maybe um, 60, 70 years ago in Silicon Valley. There's more recent one that is a great success story, and this is in Israel. So um, first, one needs to understand that uh, Israeli culture is very innovative and very driven, almost aggressive, I would say. Um, we joke that uh, Israelis are seldom right, never in doubt. Seldom right, never in doubt. But that's what people need in order to start companies. They believe in their ideas and then they mortgage their house in order to start a company because they believe they have the best idea in the world. Um, there are very good universities in Israel. Um, there were defense requirement in Israel that developed the high-tech industry uh, within the defense uh, industries. And the U.S. provided access to market because the market in Israel is very small. There's a, a foundation called the Bird Foundation by National uh, Research and Development Foundation that gave money to Israeli companies and U to an Israeli company and U.S. company that wanted to work together. So it had to be companies from both countries that wanted to work together, and they got a loan that they had to return from profits. So this foundation is self-sustaining because they have enough success stories that are continues to bring money to this. So that provided, and that was very important in the development of uh, the Israeli uh, R&D cluster. So the Israeli R&D cluster really started with the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, where the worldwide defense industry went into recession, and there were many good engineers in high tech that became available. And then the Israeli government uh, encouraged entrepreneurship because they gave VC firm, venture capital firm, matching funds. If you raise $50 million, we will give you $50 million, and then you can start um, giving, making investment in companies. Um, they also started state incubators, um, where people with an idea got $100,000 in order to demonstrate um, their ideas. And there's question as to whether that was successful or not. But clearly, the fact that the defense industry has gone down, many good engineers, innovative, aggressive engineers became available, and money uh, became available. That's what developed the uh, R&D cluster in Israel. It also was um, uh, the late 80s, um, and the internet uh, started at the time. So the internet really helped uh, the Israeli companies uh, be successful. And then the dot-com boom uh, really drove um, uh, the growth of the R&D cluster in Israel. But when it collapsed, when the bubble burst, um, the, the industry sustained in Israel continued. And today, the government in Israel is trying to do the similar model to pharma, to drug development. And we'll see if that would be successful. 
but that's the sort of the Israeli entrepreneurship. And I'd like to uh, finish with a slide that is just summarizes uh, uh, a little bit of my own thoughts. So if Okinawa needs uh, entrepreneurship, which are the models that will be applicable? And I really think that none of them will be applicable to Okinawa, that Okinawa must develop its own brand. And you can go through all the, the things that I showed in, in both of these places and see how much of it is applicable to Japan. So what could be things that um, develop here in Okinawa? First, I think OIST should be, play a very important role. So it'd be based on academic excellence. I mean, we, we saw the presentation from uh, um, Singapore about uh, bringing companies in and so on. Uh, I think the model here could be on academic uh, excellence that will little by little will develop the area here into an R&D cluster. Um, uh, it needs to be, um, from a focus point of view, uh, the institute need to look at the number of areas, but eventually funnel it down to one or two things where they can be the best in the world. And that these things need to leverage the strengths of this place. Uh, I don't know, ocean, you need to look forward to, uh, to what areas are going to be important 10, 20 years from now maybe sustainability and so on, and not try to catch up with other areas that started 50, uh, 100 years earlier. Um, and I think that um, it's relatively easy to attract the best scientists uh, in the world if you do something where Okinawa has a unique, uh, unique advantage in. Uh, and as Julie suggested, it could be permanent, could be rotation. Rotation could be very attractive to many people. And then, uh, the R&D cluster itself, in my opinion, needs to leverage the Japanese strength. The Japanese economy, second in the world, third in the world, doesn't matter. Very strong economy. And that needs to be, um, uh, it needs to be leveraged uh, here. And one of the things that one can do is, is bring corporate Japan to do R&D centers here around the universities R&D centers in the areas that the university is going to be very strong at. And the American style entrepreneurship, uh, I believe, will develop uh, in due course. Okay, so that summarizes uh, my thought. Yeah, Sorry if it was too long. Thank you, Dr. Sas Somek. I believe that presentation provides a lot of food for thought. Uh, it's Particularly, I believe the suggestion on pursuing individuality was very good. I actually went to Israel two months ago to do an interview, and it was a very entrepreneurial country. The United States is a country of immigrants. Uh, Israel is also a country of immigrants. Okinawa, however, is a place where the people have been living happily together for a long time. So how to develop entrepreneurship here is going to be our next challenge. I believe that this will not come from Okinawa, but that instead it will have to come from overseas and we will have to learn from it.